Welcome. We are so glad that you're here with us at Oakwood Community Church. Uh, we like to call each other friends and family, so would you just take a second and wave at someone down the road for you and tell them good morning? Good morning. I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Well, good morning to you, you all. Uh, my name is Pastor Ben. I am one of the pastors here on staff. I am the youth pastor, which means I get to work with our middle school, high school, and college age students. Uh, if you are new here at Oakwood, we'd like to just say hello and welcome. Uh, we have a welcome booth in our lobby, and if you stop there, we get a, a gift bag that we'd love to give you this morning. Uh, we have a, a pretty packed service for you this morning, uh, so we're going to have a few people here on stage for you to hear from, uh, but if you would, just take a second with me and pray uh, as we uh, begin our service this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be here at Oakwood this morning. We thank you for each and every one of the people that is around us that we get to call our friends and family. We thank you for uh, the opportunity we have just to come and worship you, uh, to just lift up the name of your son uh, this morning, Father. Father, we love you. We thank you. We invite you into this place. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Roger Sovis to the stage, and he's going to share with us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. I just want to take a few moments this morning. Um, if we look to the Old Testament, we see over and over and over God's chosen people praise him and not too long after, end up worshiping other gods. There was a point where they were actually worshiping poles called Asherah poles, and they fell into sin. And it's in Second Chronicles where God is talking to Solomon in chapter 7, and he says this, When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. My friends, we are at a time in our nation, if you've been paying attention the last five years, let alone the last 10 years, let alone the last 50 plus years that I've been alive, you will see that our country has turned a dark corner. We are in a post-Christian nation. And I would ask you today, I want to challenge you today. We are all given the same gift every day, 24 hours a time, 168 hours a week, 8,376 hours a year. Will you join us here in this room Thursday night, National Day of Prayer, 7 p.m. for two hours. Just two hours. That's all we're asking, that we can come together. We're going to spend a few minutes in worship, praising our God. Then we're going to break up three to four people. We're going to have sections of prayer. You can pray in small groups. As we approach 8 o'clock, we're going to put up on the screen a live stream and we're going to join churches around our country. We're going to start, go seven locations from the northeast to the southeast, all the way over to the southwest, to the northwest, and back again, and pray together as God's people. Please join us. See you Thursday, 7 o'clock, here. Thank you. Amen, amen. Everyone rise, and let's continue on in worship. Yeah. 
And which is kind of a weird uh, title for a song normally. I feel like a lot of us feel overwhelmed uh, quite often in life. Don't know why I want to sing about it. Um, but that's kind of the whole point of this is that we're trying to shift our focus. I've heard it said before that like an acorn can block out an entire mountain and only close enough to your eye. Right? So I think sometimes in life it's really easy for a problem when things go wrong. They are big.
So glad that you're with us this morning. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. We have fires on the screen. It means it's a fireside chat. So PD sits down to talk with you. And the first thing we need to do is say congratulations to the teacher of the universe. Or uh, what is the teacher of the year? Mary Boomer was awarded teacher of the year. Did you see that? Wow, we've got a teacher of the year. That's exciting. Now I know that card says thank you for visiting Oakwood, but it's really, it really means teacher of the year. So we're, we're so glad that uh, you got that award. I was excited about that. We were thrilled when people achieve things and not surprised that Mary was recognized for her work. Thank you for being a part of Oakwood. Uh, on the screen, you're gonna see some things coming up here that guides me in my conversation, so I know what I'm supposed to talk about. First thing is the Israel trip. We have a meeting right after this service, and it's an informational meeting. Now, if you come, you're not locked into going on the trip. But if you're interested at all, I would encourage you to come and stay and listen to the information. Uh, the cost actually did go down. When I first put the cost out, I was being very cautious, making sure we didn't have to raise the price. Good news, we got to lower the price. And so uh, we're excited about that. It's a wonderful trip. Uh, Julie and I are going. I'll be the host of the trip. I've been on the trip before uh, with this company. I love this company and their work, excellent work they do. Come and stay for the meeting and, and hear about it. And then maybe you can figure out a way where you could join us. I know it's a big uh, financial investment to do that, but it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You need to be able to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We tell the stories, we go through the New Testament, and to be in the actual place where Jesus was at, uh, or in several of these locations, we're going to be exactly where Jesus stood and did his ministry. And so we'd encourage you to consider coming on this trip. It's a year from now, April 16th, we depart from Detroit. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to stay and just listen to the information. Next on our list we're going to talk about is SOS. Come on up, Barry. Barry Toombs. Barry's helping me lead this one. He is going to be our, our key director of this SOS. Barry, say everything you want to say about SOS, and then I'll talk too. Okay. Um, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but after having been inside all winter, I've got cabin fever, and I'm ready to get outside and get my hands dirty. Are you? Okay, well, Pastor, you sound like you're ready. I don't know about everybody else. Um, I don't know if I can get you excited about that, but I'm going to try a little bit. Uh, one of the things we learned this past Wednesday night in Pastor's uh, Discovering God class is that uh, the church is a cohesive body, and we need each other. We need each other for encouragement. We need each other uh, you know, to come alongside each other and help each other. And this event that we have going on in just a couple of weeks out at House of Providence, we need you. We need probably, what, about 50 people? Uh, we need strong backs to rake mulch, to haul pea gravel. Uh, if you like planting flowers, we need a few people pr for that. Are we doing anything else that day? That's mostly that, okay. Um, so please sign up at the Oak after the service if you're interested in doing that, and I look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate Barry's help with this. Uh, we went out there together to Austin Providence and looked over these projects. Uh, and again, I wanna make sure you understand, House of Providence probably could have done this on their own. Uh, they do have a full-time facilities manager. Uh, he could have done this over weeks. Uh, the point isn't, can they do this on their own? The point is, we get to work together. And that's what I love about it, seeing our people fellowship together, work together to accomplish something that would have taken weeks and takes us just an hour or two. And so I encourage you to sign up. There's a, a form you got to fill out, a medical liability release. We shortened it. We took out all the illegalese that we could. And it's uh, one form per family now. You fill out, if you're a single, you just fill out the thing. If, if you're a family, you fill out the thing and then you put your kids' names and sign it for them at the bottom. Simple as can be. Sign up at the Oak. Let us know you're coming. We meet here at 930 for prayer that Saturday. Then we'll head out together. Uh, we'll start the work project around 10-ish. It's just over 24, uh, so it's not far from here. And um, bring, uh, we need wheelbarrows. We need lots of wheelbarrows to haul that mulch. Uh, wheelbarrow shovels would be great. And if you're one that would rather do the planting of the flowers and things, Deanna Boyne and my wife are heading up that project. And they say hand 
gardening tools. What's that called? A spade. Uh, you know, you dig in the ground with a hand tool. Bring those tools with you, a trowel, those kind of things. And you're going to be planting those around the house. But we're, we're actually making an area for their staff to uh, go out onto a mulched area with the picnic table stuff so they can have their uh, outdoor stuff. So uh, we get to work together that day. I encourage you to sign up and be a part of that work day. And then because of that, uh, I was working with them months ago and trying to figure out a day. This day worked great until we booked it and then I realized I booked it exact same time that people feeding people usually happens. Uh, the second Saturday of every month, our church uh, takes care of the breakfast uh, for, for people in need in downtown Oxford at the United Methodist Church. Different small groups do that and here I booked SOS right at the exact time, right on the exact day. Good news is Deanna Boyne uh, worked it out so we could bump that for two Saturdays. And so S uh, SOS is Saturday, May 13th. People feeding people is actually going to take place on May 27th, two weeks after that. I think that's the right date. 14th, yeah, 7th. So 27th on the Saturday in the morning. Now it's not given to a small group this time. Turns out that it's an open day. We need volunteers. It's, nobody's taking care of this one for us. About two times a year, I just have to get six people volunteered to do that one-time thing. So if you're interested in that, stop at the Oak and say, hey, I'll serve uh, down that, that morning. It's 8.30. We meet at United Methodist on Burdick Street, Oxford. Serve there for a couple of hours, clean up, and then you head home. So if you're interested in that, a family can do that together. Uh, couples can do that. Uh, singles can do that, just sign up and be part of those two things, SOS and the uh, people feeding people. Good. Did I cover everything? Yes, the fire's back. All right. You need to open your Bibles to Romans. Haven't said that for a while. Good. Run that bumper. We haven't seen this video for a while. Thank you. That bumper video is purposeful because I have to get myself together up here, doing lots of things in one day. I'm juggling, right? And so that was perfect. Thank you for doing that. We're in Romans. We've been in the series for quite some time. We're in chapter 12. If you recall, chapter 12 was a huge turn and a, a big important um, moment when Paul is making a, a new point or a big point. Uh, a lot of the first part of Romans was all have sinned, Everyone is a sinner without excuse. It doesn't matter if you were born in a Christian family. It doesn't matter uh, if you go to religious services. We're all born sinners, and we need Jesus. The good news is Paul taught us that Jesus is the answer for everybody, for the Jews and the Greeks and for the Romans, for, for all people. And then we got to the part of Romans chapter 12 where I want to go back because it's a key part. And we, we're going to recap that big idea. When we started Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it was time for total transformation. Do we have that on the screen, Romans 12, 1 and 2? If not, I can just say it. It's a, a key verse, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to detest and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we were a couple of months ago turning this corner, and Paul says, therefore, after all that he said about sin and salvation, now he tells believers, therefore, because of this great salvation, he tells us it's time for transformation. That means commitment. Everybody say commitment. Was that hard to say? We, we are so afraid of commitment today, right? Now, I, I know, I just did this whole thing. There's like 
five things to sign up for today. There's so many things going on. We got home plate, we got SOS, we've got uh, the, the people feeding people. There's, well, you just see the lady, there's a lady out in the hallway and she's just wanting people to sign up to go to a concert with her. Uh, uh, Oakwood's not sponsoring that, but she wanted to set up a table and we're like, okay, and uh, if you guys sign up to go with her, you get a group discount, woohoo. And, and yay, you come to church and you're like, ah, commitment. I don't want to sign my name. I might have to go. <laughs> and, and everybody waits. Everybody wants to wait. Like, I'll oh, just wait and see. Somebody probably nudged their husband and said, hey, we're going to sign up for that. No, 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 no. Let's just wait and see. Right? Or the wife said, oh, I can't even imagine that. That's like two weeks from now. Oh, we got a thousand things to do before that. And everybody's afraid to commit. Well, as my email said yesterday, we don't get more time. You have to make time. You make time for things. That's why we say, sign up today. Why? We want you to, to, to put this, reserve it, and say, I'm doing this, and nothing else will come up. Oh, but what if, what if uh, there's a special event that comes up, and I you know, commit, commit. The part of transformation that happens that Paul's talking about is Offering your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know that, right? Christianity says, no big deal, just all of you. <laughs> Christianity is, is like, it's no big deal, but we just, all of you. <laughs> you gotta lay it all down. It's not, a, it's not a put a foot in, right? Coming to Christ is not, a, I'm just gonna put my foot in the water and test this out. No, it's jumping off the deep end, right? How many of you guys are, are slow getting into pool people? I don't understand y'all. You're prolonging the terrible pain. When you crawl in one inch at a time and, oh, oh, it's cold. Oh, it's cold, right? Oh, it's cold, right? My wife got me a, a hot tub for uh, my birthday, for Christmas. It's an inflatable, it's a portable one, and, you know, it, it, but it's great. I cranked that baby up to 104. I love it hot. And I get in, I get in the tub and I sit down and I turn on the bubbles. And my wife gets in and she's like, oh, it's hot. Oh. She does that thing where she, you know. I'm like, just get in. Oh. Ooh. I'm like, just get in. You just got to commit. Christianity is a, it's an all in, all in. You jump in, you dive in. And that's what Paul is saying. Commitment. It's a call to change. Everybody say change. Paul says it's, it's giving your bodies as a living sacrifice and then being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Commitment and change. That was the key, and we gotta keep reminding you of that. That's a huge two-verse part that Paul's now gonna unwrap. He went directly from offering your bodies as a living sacrifice and being transformed in the way you think to explaining spiritual gifts. He's basically saying, hey, good news, people. <laughs> you're gonna give your whole self, you're gonna think differently, so the Spirit has gifted each of you to benefit the body of the church. Y'all have gifts to serve with. And the spiritual gifts are a call to collaborate. Look at all the gifts. There's a lot of spiritual gifts. In this room, we probably have all these gifts. It's a gift mix. It's a wonderful thing. We learn it's a call to think correctly. It's a, thought, a call to think corporately. And it's a call to think constructively. It's all about the body. Got to think correctly about your spiritual gifts. It's not about you. It's not about your gift and how special you are. No. It's just a gift to help the church. That's why it's corporate. Constructively, it's to build the church of God. That brings us to today. Everything done in genuine Love. On a count of three, we're gonna say genuine love. Ready? One, two, three. Genuine love. Now it's time to pray. Meet me in Romans 12, verse nine. Let's pray together. Would you pray this? Just give this prayer silently to God. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. And God, I pray you'd be glorified. I pray that people hearing this message would be edified and that Satan would be horrified. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read it. Again, I remind you, 
living sacrifices, thinking correctly, gifted spiritually. And then Paul says love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people in need, practice hospitality. Because of this, many people think Paul went to bed and he took a little notepad with him and his pencil and during the night he, he couldn't sleep. He woke up, you know what? Love must be sincere. And he slept for another 10 minutes. You know what? Hate what is evil. And he slept for a while. Oh, you know what? Cling to what is good. Uh, some people read this passage and think, okay, so Paul is just, and I know I put it on your notes, cross it off, I shouldn't have done it. You can't use these terms anymore. Some people think it was just rapid fire. And you can't say rapid fire anymore, I get it. But just spewing out a bunch of random thoughts that has nothing to do with anything. That's how most people look at this passage. It's like, okay, Paul has been very logical. Now all of a sudden he's just gonna go and then all this stuff, right? But it's not, it's not. It is so purposeful. It is not random rambling exhortations. That's what I should have put instead of um, ran, uh, rapid fire. Apparent random rambling exhortations. Let's look at the list. Doesn't it kind of seem like that? It was just kind of like, here's a bunch of good stuff, do this too. No, he says love must be genuine. Then he says hate what is evil. Some of you in your translations might have abhor, abhor, that's a great word, abhor. Remember when I talk about words like love and hate and say that we've changed the definitions and then there's times when Jesus uses the word hate and it doesn't mean emotional despising. Like when he says, if you don't hate your mother and father, but he's not saying despise them. What he's using that term there is, uh, you're not gonna be able to show the acts of love. You, you are gonna withhold the acts of love because you're leaving them to serve me. And so it's not an emotional hate. I need you to know that here, it means hate. It means abhor. It means do not love evil. Despise it. Notice it's evil, not evil people. That's the hard thing, Christianity Evil things are usually done by people and we, we, we hate the people, but God tells us that it's evil that we should hate. When we see evil, every time evil appears, we should hate that. And then he says, cling to what is good. The word cling here is like a baby to its mother. Clings on to, holds on to what is good. Devoted to one another. Devoted three pages in already engaged in a full-bodied way honor that means put others first respect r-e-s-b-e-c-t find out what it means to me suck it to you suck it to you suck it it's respect people honor them you respect them by putting them above yourself and theirs first it's Six, diligent in growth. This, this has the idea of not lagging behind. Don't slow the pace <laughs> of the church <laughs> because you refuse to grow. No, don't, don't, don't slothfully follow Christ. But diligent, be diligent to grow. Be fervent in the spirit. That means full-bodied in the spirit, energized by the authentic life in the spirit. And then serve. Then there's actually some mental things here. Be joyful in hope. Patient in tribulation. Constantly in prayer. Share with God's people and practice hospitality. This list is incredible because it looks like it might be just random, but it's so not random. Paul is actually doing something here. Uh, eyeballs here for a second. In Romans 12 is the top, it's the new thought. Living sacrifices transform minds. Take an arrow and go down. That leads us to 
being gifted spiritually to serve the body. We're talking about the body now, right? And that brings us to another thought. It must be done in genuine love. This shouldn't be a surprise to you. If you read 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the same logic. He talks about spiritual gifts, and then he says, what good is speaking in tongues if it does not have love? If it does not have love, it's just a, a banging gong and a clacking cymbal, right? These are the same thought processes that Paul gave before. You got spiritual gifts, but it's not about you. It's not for your glory. It's to serve the body. So it must be done in genuine love. So look at this list again on the, is this list random? Well, number one, the first thing there is not something to do. The rest of them are things to do. The first is a statement about love. <laughs> love must be what? Love must be genuine. I think you've tracked with me. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a self-sacrificing experience. The problem is thinking that the church exists for you. It's not. In the analogy of a body, Paul calls us a body, he says the, the body is not for the hand. The hand is for the body. It, it, if you show up and you're a hand and you think, where's my, and you know, this is the attitude. The hand is like a give me. <laughs> yeah. The church better give me. I, I, I better like the way. Alec, you're in big trouble today if you didn't play my favorite songs. Alec, I came this morning to church. You better do my favorites. I didn't know those songs. Oh. See, the hand, the hand goes around like this. Give me, give me. And Paul is saying, that's not genuine love. The hand is for the body. Serve. Give. We, we show up for the good of the body and we exist for the good of the body. Now listen, I know, eyeballs here, don't be upset. Should you receive? Yes. Man, if you show up, you should be blessed. You should leave overwhelmed with blessings and love and encouragement. That's a wonderful benefit. But that's not what you come for. That's serendipitous <laughs> that you get that too. Yeah, listen, I, I, I love missions and I love missions trips and I went to a huge conference once and we sat around and we fought it out, we debated. Is a mission trip for the people you're going to serve or is it for the people who are serving? And I heard both sides fighting. It should only be for the people we're going to serve. It's all about them, only them. And then the other people are like, yeah, but it's God's people will grow and the growth is an incredible thing. And I'm looking at these guys like, y'all stupid. It's both. Sometimes in life you get both hand. Everybody say both hand. both hand. Both hand. I mean, yeah, God is both just and love. That's why we got a beautiful thing there. The just God loves us enough to send us and to die for us. Both and. Is missions for the people you're going to serve? It better be or why go? But there's a wonderful thing that happens when we go as a body, we grow. It happens, it's serendipitous. It's a surprising, wonderful thing that comes from that event. And so when we talk about the hand and the body, we talk about who we are, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about God's church. So then Paul, in his wisdom, says, living sacrifices, transformed, spiritually gifted, done in love. So here's the key exhortation. This is not randling, random ramblings. Paul's one exhortation is this. Love must be genuine, which means without hypocrisy. Now I was planning on preaching all the way through verse 21. I'm in my office looking at the calendar saying, when am I gonna get done with this Romans? And I'm trying to, and I got halfway through writing this message and I'm like, I can't. We can't just keep flying a 747 at 586 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. Sometimes, you know, you ever flown to Florida? You Michiganders, you white pasty people. We, we fly to Florida in the winter. I got to speak out there. When I was traveling and speaking, uh, they, they flew me out to Florida to speak at this conference. And as I'm flying in the daytime, we get, you know, I'm leaving in this white 
ground gray sky, no sun in the sky. And I get to Florida and there's a sun shining, there's an ocean and there's green. And as we're coming in the land, I notice these green trees with little orange balls on them. And I'm like, those are orange groves, wow. But then I got in my car and drove to the place I was speaking at and it was in the middle of an orange grove. And when I got out of my car, I went, whoa. It was an amazing experience. Listen, we can't quite experience what God has for us if we keep flying at, at, at 586 miles at 30,000 feet and, and thinking that Paul is just going, we got to slow your roll, <laughs> land the plane, get out and walk through the grove here today. So I had to shorten this. I know we're going to have to go longer, but we need to take some time and unpack this. There's just one thing you need to be thinking about today. Love must be genuine. No hypocrisy. You know hypocrisy is that word in Greek acting in ancient Greece, they would have these stage plays and they didn't have huge backstage and all the technology we have. And so typically people played one or two roles and they would make up this side. They would actually have two outfits on. This half was one character. This face was made up as one character. But then they would turn and their face would be a different character and the clothes would be different on this side. And they would play two roles. They were two-faced. That's where this whole thing comes from. And hypocrisy means two-faced you're two different things. Now, most people claim that the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites, and to that I say amen, but we probably are. We're, we're not great at actually doing what we say. Sometimes we fail at that, but we're growing by God's grace. But I don't think that's what it means here. I, I, I don't think it means we're, we're saying one thing and doing another. I think what this means is don't pretend you have love and it's not real. You're faking that. It, it's not genuine. That's what I think is meant here when Paul is saying this. So we've got to unpack this whole thing. Love cannot be some saccharine sentimentality. Did I say that right? Sentimentality. Sentimentality. Sentimental. It's a saccharine. You guys know what saccharine is? Remember that artificial sweetener? Come on, people. Who's people my age or older? Don't you remember Tab? Whoever drank Tab Cola, Right? Cancer in a bucket, it's, it's awful. I mean, it was awful. It was cancer in a can, right? We used to drink that. We used to go to that stuff. I grew up in a family. My mom was always concerned about weight. Mom, I know you're watching. Sorry about this. We had Tab Cola. The worst tasting stuff in the world, by the way, but we drank Tab Cola because us Jackson, we're big boned people. And, and so, you know, you know, we're going to eat that double cheeseburger fries and that shake, but we'll wash it down with that Tab Cola, hoping that that'll make it all wash away, right? If I suffer through the Tab, all the calories should be disappeared. And so Tab, full of saccharine, fake sweetener. Now you're fancier today, because I know you are, because my wife is. My wife uses, she sneaks it in. It's not saccharine, it's monk fruit sweetener. Anybody give me an amen? Somebody know what that is? Anybody order that on Amazon like it's going out of style? We got, we got monk fruit sweetener all over the place at our house. And my wife will do things. Like she'll make a dessert. You know, she'll be like, hey. And she'll put it down and I'll go, oh. As soon as I put it in my mouth, I'm like. That's that, that's that monk fruit stuff. Why? I don't know. Because what is it? Don't you be, there's no rebuttal. What did you, what? Is, it, is it the stuff that, that when you breathe in, your mouth feels cold? I don't know what it is, but it, you know it's not normal or natural because it's weird. You eat it, and it's like, yeah, that's sweet, but as you're breathing in air, you're like, it feels like you're sucking in the Antarctica. It's like, why is that cold? Why do I taste metal? You know, it's fake. It's fake. Honey, I'm not saying it was bad. It was wonderful. It was great. <laughs> it was wonderful. And she's, she's only trying to help me, right, amen? Everybody in the church say, thank you, Julie. We're trying to keep this guy alive, right? She's trying anything she can. She tries a fake sweetener, whatever she can do. I get it. But it's fake. It's saccharine sentimentality. That's what's in the church when we claim to love, but it's not genuine love. It's a cheap substitute. That's what we're getting at. So here's our problem. Our problem is, let's go back to the definition of love. Remember our definition of love? Oh, good, you should know this, right? 
Love is selfless, willing sacrifice for the good of another person, even when they don't deserve it, not expecting anything in return. You had that down, right? Right, it should be on your refrigerators at home, whatever, or written in your Bibles. Let's do it one more time, I'll say it for you. Love is selfless, willing sacrifice for the good of another person, even if they don't deserve it, not expecting anything in return. That's genuine love. It's easy to come to church and hand out saccharine sentimentality. How are you today? I'm fine. Good. Good. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm fine. Good. And we, we go home and we're like, nothing real happened there, right? There was no real exchange. There was no real connection there. So here's our problem. All people's problem is that we're born... All of us are born selfless or selfish. I wrote it down somewhere. We are born selfish. We are born in the context of alienation and self-centeredness. Nobody has to teach a two-year-old to be selfish. It just comes naturally. Nobody has to tell an infant, hey, listen, if, you're, if your diaper's poopy, go ahead and tell us, Right? If you wet your diaper, just go ahead and tell her. We won't be mad. Just go ahead and say something. Or, or you can cry a little bit. You never have to teach your children that, do you? Moms, amen? You don't have to tell a baby who's hungry in the middle of something important, you know, to, to go ahead and interrupt because you need to be fed right. No, no, babies will tell you, feed me now. I'm hungry now. I've got a wet diaper now. I poop now. <laughs> Here's the chief task of every, pers- every parent. Listen to me, this is very important. Please do this, <laughs> parents, please. The chief task of every parent is to let those children know life's not all about them. Roger mentioned that we're living in very dark times and it's been, you can see it happening over, but I have never seen in my life a generation that is so, I'm not happy. And if I'm not happy, I'm gonna burn it down. I'm gonna let everybody know I'm not happy. It's not the way I want it. I'm gonna stop every meeting. I'm gonna yell at every teacher. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break everything down. I'm gonna tear everything apart because I'm not happy. Parents, please, please, at some point, teach your children, it's not all about you. There's other people. There's other people. That's why I'll put this on the screen. It's a pretty simple point. It's not about you. I think this all makes sense. To me it does. That Paul is logically saying living sacrifices transform mind, spiritually gifted. So let it be real. <laughs> Please let it be real. And then he gives you some really good ideas about starting that real love. He gives you some good things. Like here you go. Genuine love abhors evil. Genuine love clings to what is good. And on and on he goes, but it's not random. And and loving is not the first task on the list. It is the list. (laughs) Love must be genuine. So let's dig deep. Instead of going too fast, let's talk about hypocrisy. There's two expressions of hypocrisy. Making the outside look better than what's on the inside. If, If you're gonna be fake, You're gonna put on a facade and make everybody believe what you're presenting, even though on the inside it's not anything like that. And we hear about that in Matthew 15, seven through nine. It'll be on the screen for you. You hypocrites, there's the word again. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their teachers are merely human rules. Then later in that passage, verse 25, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. There's the word again, right? Now listen to how many times the word inside and outside comes up. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, (laughs) 
You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and every unclean thing. I've talked through this passage many times in Israel and I hope the, the team that gets to go with us to Israel will see this. In the old city Jerusalem, there are water spigots and little sinks out uh, on the buildings everywhere. Why? Because the Jews must ceremonially clean their dishes and cups before eating out of them. Now, I'm all for you know, cleanliness. I'm all for that. That's fine. But they were giving Jesus a hard time because he wasn't doing the rituals. So Jesus makes a big point to, to say, you guys are all concerned about the outside appearance of things. You're all into the rules and making everybody think you're a good rule follower, but inside you're disgusting. You like the outside to look good, but inside you've got nothing. And then he really hammers it home when he says it's like a whitewashed tomb. Picture this, this tomb, this cave that you walk into and it's been painted white, it's pretty. And on the inside it's painted white, pretty. But what's in that crypt is dead bones. And I hate to be vulgar with you, he said every unclean thing. That's where they went to relieve themselves. It was their porta potties. <laughs> it was full of urine and feces and bones of dead people. Do you think Jesus was actually making a point here about hypocrisy? You like to whitewash the outside, but inside it's disgusting. So, Two expressions of hypocrisy. Number one, making the outside look better than what's on the inside. And the other expression is hiding our own flaws by drawing attention to other people's flaws. We don't like to admit that we have flaws. If we just point out that everybody else is messed up, we feel better about ourselves. Luke 6, 42. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye, you hypocrite? Look at the word. It's there again. First, take the plank out of your eye and you will see clearly how to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Two expressions of hypocrisy. If, you're, if you want to be the hand of the body that comes to church just for the what you can get, consumerism, Christianity, it's, it's invaded our church. It started happening in the 80s and, and it's been my church better be like this or my church better have that and it's been consumerism Christianity. And if you want to be that hand that comes just to take, number one, you're never going to be satisfied. It'll, you'll never be satisfied. If we want to show up and play church and make everybody think that we're perfect people, that, that, that house of cards is going to come crashing down. And I'm not, I'm not saying Oakwood's like that. Honestly, I've, I've been to churches like that in my lifetime, and Oakwood's an incredibly wonderful place where we're, we're not going to uh, dismiss you because you have flaws. We're going to welcome you with open arms. We're going to say, oh, you'll fit in perfect in this messy family. Come on, come on in. We want you here. I love that Oakwood is a safe place for people. But we hide our flaws by drawing attention to other people's flaws. That's easy to do. Don't look here. Don't look at this mess. Look over here. <laughs> look at that mess, right? And, and as long as we have somebody around us that is having a harder problem, then we, we enjoy that because, you know, we like... We like feeling safe and good about ourselves. Those are the two expressions of hypocrisy. But there's also two objectives. What are the objectives of this hypocrisy? Number one, to get and keep the praise and approval of other people. We just, we don't want to let anybody know that, that we're growing too and that we're on a journey and life's been hard. We don't want anybody to know that. You know, we want to think, we want everybody to think I've got all my stuff together. You all are a mess, but I got it all together, Right? You know, how many of you came to church today and the kids were fighting in the back, right? Anybody have that conversation where you're like, don't make me come back there. You know, you know, we're on our way to church. You guys better stop it. You know, my mom is classic. She's a classic Southern woman and, and God bless her. She raised me, right? And I had two sisters, you know, and, and, and we were, you know, sometimes we would be in trouble for her. And my mom would be like, oh, she, she'd be in the house and she'd be like, you guys, you, guys, you better stop it. You better knock it off. I'm telling you right now, if I had to do one. And the phone would start to ring. 
And, and back then it was on the wall of the house, right? And, and it had a long little twisty cord. And I remember my mom would be heading to the phone while yelling at us. I tell you right now, I'm gonna whoop you guys until you get, hello? <laughs> she could change on a dime. And it was just, hello? Everything was perfect, right? We don't, want, we don't want people to know, right? We don't want people to know it's a mess. We want praise and approval. Matthew 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Look how that just keeps showing up. In the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. I tell you the truth, they have received their full reward. We shouldn't be doing anything in our Christian walk just for the praise and approval of other people. By the way, if you do choose to do that, you've got a hard life ahead of you because you always got to keep up those appearances. You're always going to have to be polishing the outside, polishing the outside. Oh, here we are at church. We better polish up the outside. Don't let anybody know that we struggled this week. Don't let anybody know. <laughs> if you have children and they go down to Sunshine Park, we know. <laughs> One of the best tools a church has is prayer request in children's church. <laughs> Anybody want to pray? Yeah. My mom and dad have been fighting. You know, <laughs> or, <laughs> my brother is in. <laughs> we hear everything, right? And so it would just shock anybody like, oh my goodness. Uh, but don't live your life for the approval of people and praise because Jesus says, number one, God and Jesus look right through that external facade and they see who you really are. The beautiful thing is, he still chooses to love us. That's what love is, right? True intimacy is not I'm in love with the facade. True intimacy is I'm in love with you who you really are. In to me see is what real love is. Intimacy is when you love somebody because you know exactly who they are and you still choose to love them. That's intimacy, true intimacy. God knows you. So why do we play a game? Don't play a game of hypocrisy for people's praise and approval. And secondly, the objective of hypocrisy is to cover sins that may have nothing to do with how we're posturing and posing. Sometimes we, uh, uh, we have something going on that we don't want anybody to know about and so we posture and pose way over here like look over here, don't look here. And we, we put on this thing and, and, and we're hiding something that's not evident. There's a great passage and I gotta preface it this, this woman who shows up on the Sabbath and she's been hunched over. We don't know exactly what's wrong. She's been hunched over and hobbling for 18 years. For 18 years she's suffered with a life like this. Miserable. And she shows up on the Sabbath and here's what happens. Jesus heals her. Jesus goes to her and said, okay, no more of that stuff. Here we go, straighten up. And she's healed. It's a beautiful thing. 18 years, you know, it's a big deal. Verse 14 of Luke 13, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath? The synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not the Sabbath. And the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Here it is again. <laughs> Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it to water? I, I love this. This woman's hunched over, suffering for 18 years, and Jesus heals her. And the religious people are only concerned about the rules, only concerned about the external. And so the religious people scold everybody, Jesus included. How dare you come on this day and do work? When Jesus hears this, he's like, let's talk about your animals. <laughs> I was gonna use the King James for donkey there, but I better not. Let's talk about your donkey. See, I, I love that Jesus knows what they did that morning, and I'm assuming that morning these highfalutin religious people they made sure that their ox and their ass were covered and watered and taken care of because it's money to them. That's an important thing. You gotta take care of your property, right? And so they were, they were all about their own future success and so they watered their animals. 
And then they come and they tell Jesus he can't heal a woman who's been hurting for 18 years. And he's like, what? You hypocrites. You see, here they are. They, they don't want anybody to know that they worked on the Sabbath. The very rule that they're talking about there, they broke two. But they did it in private at home or nobody saw it, right? And so they, they hide it with this posturing and posing of real spirituality. And Jesus is like, oh, no, you don't. No, no, no. Don't be a hypocrite. The conclusion for this whole thought is, and it's really just one simple thought. I hope you, you understood it. This is not random ramblings. This is not rapid fire shooting out a bunch of things. Hey, do this, work on this, do this. No, Paul is saying living sacrifices transform mine, spiritually gifted, do everything in genuine love. So therefore, everything we do comes from a real care for other people, the selfless, willing sacrifice for the good of another person, even when they don't deserve it, not expecting anything in return. It's interesting, not maybe for you, but for me, when Paul says the word love early on, he uses the Greek word agape, agape, which we know that word agape is a different kind of love. There's, there's like four different kinds of love in scripture. Agape is that overarching, unconditional love. It's God's love. It's, it's who God is. God is agape. Paul says, when he says love must be genuine, he said agape must be genuine. And later on when he talks about be devoted to one another in love, he chooses a different word, phileo. And that is not the fish sandwich you can get at McDonald's. It is phileo love. It's the word we get Philadelphia from, the city, the city of brotherly love. So what Paul is saying is that list that he gives is not random ramblings. He's telling you how to live agape. How to live unconditional love, God-type love? Well, then live familial love. Church, body, live for one another. Live it out genuinely in a family. Well, we need to be done. So band, why don't you come and join us? We're gonna sing a song and close. If you can stay after for the meeting for Israel, I encourage you to do that. Hear about it at least and see what God will do. Let's pray. Father God, I pray today that you would help us with this. A love. God, help us to live this out. Help us to be truly sacrificial living lives, sacrifices, giving ourselves over completely with a transformed mind. God, help us to use our spiritual gifts not for our own benefit or to show off anything that we have, but that we would be living out this love in the body of Christ, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.